starting to <laughs> I'll also point out when you pay your dues, do not make your check out to David Mullins treasurer. They will not accept that for an organization. Make it out to friends of RNL or simply F O R N L. All right. So today for our speaker, we have Bill Snyder. He received his BS in computational physics from Yale University, a PhD in plasma physics from Princeton. He uh, did a lot of theoretical work, studied turbulent transport and fusion uh, plasma. He's originally from Ohio. He spent a couple of decades with GA in San Diego, home of the D3D machine, but mostly doing theoretical physics. He's published more than 200 peer-reviewed journal articles and has been cited over 16,000 times. Uh, Bill and his wife moved from San Diego to Oak Ridge in 2021. They're enjoying the Smoky Mountains, and I understand they like waterfalls. Uh, it's, he has many awards. He's a fellow of the American Physical Society, and despite being new to Oak Ridge, he's already a corporate fellow. He's currently serving as the director of the Fusion Energy Division. Bill, what's up with fusion? Uh, dim the light, please. Hmm. All right, thank you for the introduction. You did your research, wow. <laughs> know about the waterfalls and everything. So let's see if I can share the right one here. So yeah, I'd like to update you a little bit about what's going on you know, overall in the U.S. Fusion Energy Program and specifically what Oak Ridge is, is doing. We've been really ramping up our efforts in, in fusion over the past few years. I'll slip in a little bit of discussion of some of the research um, that I've done in the middle here. So in terms of the promise and challenges in fusion, I think many of you are familiar with this. I see some familiar faces of folks that have worked in fusion their entire career. Uh, included, but you know, fusion is is really fundamental to a lot of things. Fusion, of course, powers the stars, including our own sun, and and, and because of that, it indirectly provides nearly all sources of energy on Earth. I mean, of course, solar, um, wind, hydro are fairly directly derived from the fusion power that comes to us from the sun. Fossils, similarly, but stored up over millions of years. Even fission, the fuel for fission, the energy in that fuel comes indirectly from fusion, from the supernova of a previous generation of star. So, um, and of course, elements heavier than lithium are fusion products. So literally, the Earth itself, the planets are fusion pro products as well. So this, this process is fundamental in many ways to, to, to our world and to our sources of energy. But we're also very interested in the idea of directly tapping the energy from fusion here on Earth in a controlled, you know, safe way that will enable, you know, a transformation in the clean energy economy. So hydrogen isotopes fuse. They, they yield helium and energy when they do so, as, as illustrated in this diagram. The, the fuel supply is essentially unlimited. Um, we can get deuterium from water, lithium, you just don't need very much of it compared to the amount that is, that is out there. The, you're practically unlimited. The, it's safe and environmentally benign. There's no chain reaction involved, um, no production of, of CO2, at least in the, in the, in the uh, fusion process itself. Little or no um, long-lived radi radioactive waste provided you do things with what, what right. And it also involves minimal land use. There are flexible siting options. It's essentially, you know, it can be, you can, you can build a fusion plant anywhere where the demand is present. So the basics, again, I think a lot of you are familiar with this, but in a fusion reaction, two hydrogen-like nuclei come together, form a, a helium, helium nucleus, as well as a neutron. So roughly 80% in the easiest reaction to drive, the deuterium tritium reaction, 80% of the energy goes into the neutron. And then in a fusion system, you'll use that energy to drive, um, drive a turbine and produce electricity. 20% and then helium is a charged particle. So it stays confined in the system and self heats the plasma. So it sustains the ongoing reaction. Of course, it releases a large amount of energy, roughly on a, on a per gram basis. Um, 
DT fusion produces a factor of 10 million more energy than, than methane, a factor of about four more than, more than fission does. So, I mean, as a result of this, you can produce an enormous amount of energy with just a small amount of fuel. And to illustrate how, and if you think in terms of, I gave a lot of electricity for one day, but basically the power to power a million homes or two and a half million EVs, if you wanted to do that with coal power, you need about 8 million kilograms of coal, 80, 80 of training cars worth. So an enormous amount of fuel, it produces an enormous amount of CO2, S, you know, silicon dioxide, NOx, et cetera, as, as waste products. DT fusion, by contrast, to produce that same amount of, of electricity would need less than a kilogram of deuterium, less than a kilogram of tritium, and produce as a byproduct less than a kilogram of helium. Um, on the renewable side, you would need 3 million solar panels, 400 wind turbines. You know, we can, of course, do this, and that's an important part of the way we're addressing climate change, but the land use um, um, aspects of that are quite significant. So this is the outline. I, I've said just a few words about the basics of fusion, the potential of fusion. I, I want to talk about how this has become a very exciting new era for fusion energy development, the planning process that has gone into that inside the U.S., and then transition to Oak Ridge plants for fusion research and development. Um, I'll, I'll slip in a little bit of discussion of some of the work that I've been involved in on the role of pedestal physics in fusion performance, and then talk about public-private partnerships to support fusion development before wrapping up. So I think you, you, you've heard about, probably if you've been reading the news, um, that a new, a new era in fusion um, development has gone. The, the recent efforts have positioned fusion research for a 20-year push um, toward development. There have been recent achievements on the Jet Tokamak in England. There they produced more than 50 megajoules of fusion, fusion energy, the largest amount of fusion energy that's ever been produced in a single experiment. The National Igni Ignition Facility, this is a laser-driven fusion facility at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, um, produced a, a record amount of, of, of fusion energy from that process, and also produced a self-sustaining, what we call a propagating burn, a self-sustaining reaction where the alpha particles that were produced by fusion are producing enough energy to, to heat the fuel nearby and continue to drive, self um, drive the fusion process. There've been multiple reports from US expert groups indicating readiness and urgency. There's been significant escalation in investment all across the clean energy um, sector, and particularly that includes more than six billion um, of dollars of private money invested into fusion companies, mostly fusion startups here in the United States. On, on, the, on the science side, there's been extensive predictive tools developed and optimized to, to optimize performance. I'll talk a little bit about some of those later, as well as new technologies available to address um, new challenges. So that, that puts us in a place where we're ready to, to, to make a push toward rapid development of fusion. And this, there, there have been a number of National Academies panels, um, a couple of which I've, I've served on, that have laid out plans, um, identified challenges. Um, National Academy of, of, of Engineering identified you know, fusion as a grand challenge for the 21st century. In 2018, this burning plasma research report set us on a path toward developing a fusion pilot plant as our primary goal and indicated that now is the time for the US to develop plans to benefit from its investment in burning plasma research and take steps toward development of fusion electricity for the future's <clears throat> future energy needs. Then this later National Academies Committee laid out more specific guidelines, planning toward the development of a fusion pilot plant and a path toward putting fusion electricity on the grid indicating successful operation of a fusion a pilot plant in the 2035 to 2040 timeframe requires urgent investments by DOE and private industry, both to resolve the remaining technical and scientific issues and to design, construct, and commission a fusion pilot plant. So there's been a, a, a long, arduous planning process that's gone on within the fusion community. I think those of you that worked in fusion know the fusion community in the US used to be a bit contentious. And it, we worked very hard across the past the past few years to get you know people, institutions, and you know and and, and you know, our, our sponsors at the Department of Energy on the same page about what our goals are, what what the effort is that's required to get us to those goals. And it's laid out um, in 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 a, in a planning document that was produced by the the Fusion Energy Science Sciences Committee 
As I mentioned here before that, there was this, or parallel with that, there was a series of three community workshops. One of those was, was here in downtown Knoxville, another up in Madison, and one down in Houston, where the community got together, discussed all this, um, put together a set of key research areas and, and priorities for, for the plan. So th th this planning document, it endorses the goal um, that I described from the National Academy's reports of, of developing a fusion pilot plant to both demonstrate net electricity production from fusion and also to develop long-term materials and, and blankets, fuel cycle solutions for the whole fusion system. So the plan acknowledges that because we're entering this transition, moving closer to fusion development, there's an enhanced emphasis on fusion materials, on the fusion blanket and technology programs, and that's reflected in what we're doing in Oak Ridge, as I'll tell you later, and, but, but still continuing strong programs in basic um, theory and experimental science, supporting the ITER program. This is the international experiment under construction in France, while building a, a series of new facilities. This includes the, the impacts, um, the materials plasma exposure experiment that is under construction right now at Oak Ridge in the building right next to my office, uh, a fusion prototypic neutron source to test materials under, with, with under neutron loads of the, of the energies appropriate for fusion, and a new confinement facility to test core edge interaction as well as a blanket test facility. So we, we've got a plan that's put together. We've identified the challenges as a community and reached the point where um, institutions like Oak Ridge that has unique capabilities across the broad spectrum of important research areas in fusion can lay out plans and kick them off and, and, and get underway in important research areas. So to lay out the fusion challenge a little bit more specifically, um, in order to generate electricity from fusion, we have to meet three sort of related technical and scientific challenges. And the first of these is, is, is the one people think about the most, the one you see written about in articles about fusion, and that is to control, sustain, and predict a high temperature burning plasma to produce neutrons and heat. In other words, we have to heat up this plasma to something like 10 times the temperature of the core of the sun, greater than 100 million degrees. We have to confine this plasma long enough so that it can undergo many collisions because no matter what fuel you use, the fusion cross-section is always lower than the collisional cross-section. So you have to confine these, these particles as they travel around for, um, as they travel for thousands of kilometers and, and undergo dozens of collisions before they escape. And, and you know, in order to get the fusion reactions to occur, to produce the, the, the neutrons that can then be um, transformed into electricity from this to electricity and the self-heating alphas. So that's that's one aspect, but it's only it's only one. Another really key aspect of this, and this is related again to the fact that you're producing your energy mostly in the form of 14 and maybe neutrons, you have to find materials or develop materials that can handle the extreme conditions in a reactor. And this is tricky because testing um, materials under fusion neutron conditions requires neutrons at those energies, which are much different energies than are produced in, a, for example, in our existing uh, nuclear fission power plants. <clears throat> Finally, we have to harness fusion power. So we want to capture the energy. We want to you know, capture the neutrons, use them to, to in turn Breed, breed the fuel and reliably produce net electricity. So we need supporting systems that, um, you know, that, that, that inject fuel and, and heating into the, uh, into the plasma and then exhaust the, the, the helium, we call it helium ash, once it's cooled down, separate that back out and, and put the fuel back in as well as power conversion systems to actually produce the electricity. So in terms of technical readiness of fusion, this has to be advanced rapidly from where we are if we're going to meet ambitious timelines for fusion implementation. So again, these three areas, creating and sustaining a fusion power source, we're relatively far along with that, but there are, there are um, you know, important research areas where, where there's you know, significant work still to be done. Developing materials to survive in a fusion environment, there's been a lot of really nice work done there, but these, this kind of testing um, under the kind of the, the, ener the neutron energies and fluences that you expect to have in a pilot plant hasn't been done yet. So we're, there's, there's a ways to go in terms of technical readiness. And then even further behind is this fuel self-sufficiency and har harnessing fusion power. Here, there's only, we're, we're in the imaginable, plausible stage. So, so where, where do we go? Where, where do we take it? I mean, one of the first things that, that you can do, and this is, this is work that was done by, by Mickey Wade, I think some of you know, um, is identify what are the key aspects? What 
can we do? What can, where can we put our resources in order to have the most impact on the cost effectiveness of a future fusion energy system? Because of course, it's not enough just to show that we can plausibly produce electricity from fusion. We have to show that we can do it cost effectively and competitively with other clean energy technologies. And so when we do this, we can do this kind of simple analysis um, using a systems code to identify what factors go into the estimated cost shown here on the on the on the x-axis. And there are many, and they're inter intertwined. Um, the, the, the confinement quality and the plasma core coupled to the edge, the diverter heat flux, as well as the technology, the blankets that produce the fuel that, that I talked about are also a very important factor. The materials, um, the nuclear capable materials and interfaces, characterization, irradiation, corrosion, heat flux, advanced manufacturing, all of these things have to be addressed, but they're not independent of each other. We have to self-consistently look at an optimization of both the, the physics of the fusion core and the technology and materials that we're using um, to outside the system to get to an attractive fusion design. So this is how we've laid out our fusion program um, within the fusion energy division at, at, at ORNL. So uh, this is a, gives our, mi our vision, mission, a guiding principle. Our vision is that fusion should be the clean energy source of choice for this generation and beyond. And in partnership with public and private fusion efforts worldwide, we want to establish the technical basis for integrating, not just understanding, but integrating the burning plasma physics, next generation materials, and fusion nuclear technology critical to the design of a fusion pilot plant. So the way we've organized our program, we have a physics-centric effort on burning plasma foundations, trying to understand long pulse self-heating, the effects of high power density, develop a firm physics state, um, basis, while at the same time in our fusion nuclear science um, section, developing key technology, including fusion materials, which is also developed in the, in the, in the, in the, um, in the, in the material science and technology division at ORNL, and the blanket fuel cycle and enabling technology. We get to technology solutions, not just do these independently, integrate this all together into a single capability so that we can optimize and develop the most cost-effective systems possible for fusion. So the guiding principle is we want to pursue pathways that have the potential to deliver early fusion energy through targeted R&D to resolve technical challenges that threaten mission success, timeliness, and cost. So to do this, I mean, we, I, I mentioned these reports. You know, we've, we've laid out a plan. We've also laid out our organization in a way that is designed to line up very directly with that plan. Um, so a lot of this was the work of, of, of Mickey Wade, who was the previous Fusion Energy Director. He's now the ALD for both Fusion and Fission. Um, this shows you some of our, our, our leadership. What I really wanted to illustrate here is the, the two sections, um, the one led by Larry Baylor on the left that pursues fusion technology and engineering related to the blanket um, the, the, and, and remote systems. And then the Burning Plasma Foundation section that Cammie Collins leads. And this is looking at various aspects of the physics with a focus on integration. So we have these programs. In addition, we have the IMPEX project led by Phil Ferguson, which is under construction. We have the Fusion Materials Program and the Materials Science and Technology um, Division and the Division Director there is Utah Cato. Um, and then of course, we're closely coupled to the US EATER project, which is led by um, Kathy McCarthy over here in, in Commerce Park. So within the last um, three years, you know, we, we now have more than 100 staff in the fusion energy division, more than about a third of those have been hired within the last three years, includes myself. Um, we have more than 50 staff in our technology section, including more than 15 working on blankets. You know, three years ago, we had a couple. Now we have, now we have 15. We're, we're, we, are, we, are, we are building up our workforce. Um, we're doing it in a way that's, you know, consistent with DEI principles and also developing the diversity of capabilities and expertise that's needed to develop fusion. So in terms of strategy, um, it's laid out in, into three areas here. We want to advance the cutting edge um, solutions through science. We want to deliver technology test facilities like ETER and IMPACTS. And finally, I'll, I'll talk about this a little, a little at, the, at, at the end. We want to enable private fusion's aggressive timelines. So first uh, on the cutting edge science, um, here the goal is to maintain and expand our R&D portfolio focused on fusion's most challenging problems across 
burning plasma physics, materials, um, producing and refueling tritium on the fly, blanket R&D, and making it all economical. And as I mentioned, this, this research is conducted in the Burning Plasma Foundations section, in which we have four groups um, led by the folks shown here, here on power exhausted particle control, advanced tokamak physics. This group is actually largely located out in San Diego, working on the D3D um, tokamak, the plasma theory and modeling group led by Gary Stabler in diagnostics and controls, led by Ted Buer. Um, we, uh, we have a couple of new projects. I was just talking to some of you about this. There, a, a bunch of new projects have just been kicked off right here at the end of the, of the last fiscal year. And a couple of these projects are focusing on integrated simulation, which is really um, very central to the goals that we have in the program. So one of these is led by Cami. This is a SIDAC project. Um, it, it's a simulation project on fusion reactor design and assessment. So she's working on bringing together these physics integrated modeling tools with the technology tools to optimize the whole system. And then there's another project whose kickoff meeting I missed because I had to give this talk um, <laughs> that is on uh, enabling tokamak pulse simulation by machine learning of four pedestal boundary physics. So Sebastian and his group are working on using um, machine learning, artificial intelligence techniques, to bring together some of these really sophisticated models that we have to simulate the plasma. But these sophisticated models may take you know, hours or weeks or months to run on thousands of computer cores. And so we have to simplify those down, both with analytic approximations to develop effective reduced models, and then in engaging machine learning can be a very effective way to make them very fast. So, we're delivering cutting edge tools um, for burning plasma realization. Some of the areas that ORNL has focused in are pellet fueling and control, understanding both the physics basis of pellet fueling and using pellets to control these events that we call disruptions, where one loses the plasma very quickly and you have to, you have to ameliorate that, mitigate that, so that you don't have uh, negative effects on the plasma facing materials. Determining practical implications of when we do that of the transient control and testing continuous pellet fueling for optimal density profile as a long pulse operation. We've just, um, just qualified a new pellet system for use on the W7X Stellarator off in Germany and compatibility with high scrape off layer via the fueling systems that Daisuke Shiraki and others um, develop uh, or use on, on the D3D token like out in San Diego. So this is what I think where Oak Ridge really thrives is bringing together the, phys the science and the technology to really optimize these systems. That, Similarly, in the boundary solutions, validating core edge integration requirements and high performance core and detached diverter and optimizing diverter to the first wall and design control. The diverter is this device down at the bottom that has to capture these very large heat fluxes. And we have to design it in order to keep the materials cool and eroding at a sustainable rate. And then, as I mentioned, integrated modeling, where we're putting our physics models together to um, understand comprehensively and be able to optimize the system and design it. Now, one of the areas that Oak Ridge has been engaged in for decades, of course, is, is materials research and materials under challenging conditions. And, you know, I mentioned, you know, fusion is almost the perfect energy source in terms of its, its overall profile, the availability of the fuel is clean. But from a materials perspective, Fusion is kind of the, uh, the, 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 the most challenging um, environment that materials ever face. And this is because you're combining several aspects, you know, the high temperatures and high stresses, the materials that face the plasma, the complex chemical environment. One has to use lithium out in the blanket because lithium is the material that, um, that enables breeding of the fuel from the neutrons. Um, and at the same time, because you have these large neutron fluxes, you can get atomic displacements, damaging materials, and you can drive actual transmutations of, of material from one to the other. So one has to deal with all of the implications of the fusion environment on materials and do it simultaneously. So this, this is something that Oak Ridge has developed a lot of effort and has some very sophisticated tools um, for investigating. And these include, you know, the advanced manufacturing facility um, over in Hardin Valley, um, alloy development, which has been ongoing, low activation steels have been de developed at, at Oak Ridge um, for, for a long time. So developing new materials, 
evaluating them in the nuclear environment, including testing, for example, on, on Hyper, the high flux isotope reactor, where via long exposures, you can drive these materials to 50, even 100 dPA, the kinds of the kinds of stresses they would undergo in fusion. And then, of course, hot cells and the Lambda facility to investigate using uh, you know, electron micro mi microscopy and other tools to investigate the, the materials after exposure. And then the interface to the fusion environment. And this involves um, existing um, smaller facilities like the Corrosion Science Laboratory, but then also the impacts device, which is under construction. So the other side of, of, develop, of our fusion strategy is, is providing fusion technology solutions. And this, this takes place in, the, in the, the fusion science technology and engineering section led by Larry Baylor. You can see this in what you know, involves blanket and fuel cycle research, fusion technology, fusion engineering, remote systems, and also because of the importance of the blanket program, we've identified the program lead there, Paul Hammerkaus. Again, we have some exciting new projects kicking off here. One is on liquid metal physics. Liquid metals are potentially attractive, both as a plasma basing material or as a blanket flowing material. And um, you know, this new project will study those in detail. And then we're talking about this a little bit earlier, the new Varma has gotten funding um, for a project called the Maintainable Fusion Pilot Plan, where he will be developing remote maintenance tools, which are very critical to, um, particularly for a pilot plant as an experimental facility, but also in the long run for a fusion power plant where one has to do maintenance efficiently um, in order to keep costs down. So on the technology side, we're engaged in multiple fusion technology efforts, including fueling system development. And you can see this is the Eater steady state pellet injector um, being developed. You can see the person beside it, the scale of the technology required to do this on Eater is very impressive. The high flow rates and pretty compatibility are things that we're developing. Um, radio frequency technology, heating with both electron cyclotron and ion cyclotron um, systems, developing the transmission lines, supporting equipment and integrated control, and then remote systems, as I mentioned, providing practical solutions to challenging remote handling issues in the fusion environment. A lot of this technology has been developed, of course, for fission systems, but now we are adapting that to, to, the, to the fusion specific environment. And of course, we're doing um, a significant amount of, of R&D to support the blanket technology, including testing helium cooling strategies to blankets with helium loop, that includes um, advanced manufacturing to develop rib surfaces inside to facilitate um, heat transport. Heat transfer, as you know, helium is attractive because of its, you know, it's, it's benign in a, in, a, in a neutron environment, but it's not a very effective coolant. And so one has to really optimize these systems in order to um, generate as much heat transfer as possible. So we're also testing um, lead lithium as a potential blanket material with compatibility with these low activation of ferritic steels and thermal convective loop and planned corrosion loop. Um, so this, this is laying out the technology vision for the future. We want to continue to understand um, hel helium cooling flow and helium flow loop, lead development of steady state fueling and pumping in a closed loop, continue to develop these radio frequency um, heating and current drive technologies needed for fusion development, leverage opportunities to develop fusion specific remote handling solutions and develop and test subs subsystems for blanket component test facilities. So putting all that together, we want to develop the infrastructure to support a fusion technology ecosystem that will have to go through these stages of development to get us ready to produce fusion electricity. So as I mentioned, so that's, you know, our, our physics program, our technology program, a really critical importance to what we're trying to do is that we want to bring all of this knowledge together into a coherent integration platform that can actually do the full optimization of a fusion system, something that's never really been done before. Existing systems and, and design of existing devices and planned devices has largely been done at low fidelity with systems codes, picking a point, and then doing detailed analysis. What we're trying to develop, what we're working on developing is what we refer to as medium fidelity. It can actually be high fidelity as long as it's fast, but very efficient technologies or very efficient simulations for um, exploring both the core plasma physics, the edge plasma physics, and the key technology, neutronics, tritium migration, thermal mechanics, thermal hydraulics, um, helium CFP, in a way that the calculations are fast enough that we can integrate them 
play the mock against each other and do rapid iteration, iteration, including accounting or design under uncertainty, uncertainty quantification, and develop optimal systems. So that's 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 a key focus. And then I wanted to include, let's see how we're doing on time, as an interlude, a little bit of a discussion of some of my own technical work. Um, you know, it was mentioned in, in, in the introduction. I've been working on what's called pedestal physics and uh, developed a, a, a mode called the, the super H mode. And I want to talk a little bit about what that is and how it fits in this overall framework of integration. So uh, just to introduce a little bit technically about how magnetic confinement fusion works. This is, prim this is the primary type of fusion system that we study at RNL, although we do also have some work in other areas, including on inertial fusion. Um, you know, we talk about building a star in Earth, but we don't, we don't mean that literally, of course. You can't, you know, gravity is far too weak to confine a plasma on Earth and have it reach fusion conditions. You have to build something much larger than Jupiter to do it that way. But we can use magnetic fields. Of course, the, the magnetic force is much stronger than the gravitational force to confine charged particles in a plasma. So, I mean, as you know from Physics 101, if you have a strong magnetic field, charged particles in a plasma will execute gyro orbits around that field. And so they, they'll, they'll be confined in two dimensions, but not in the third, right? They can freely flow along the field line. So what do you do? Um, well, in toroidal devices like tokamaks and stellarators, what you do is you take those field lines and you bend them around into a torus so that they're connected on the ends. And, um, but the trick is when you do that, that necessarily generates a non-uniform um, non magnetic field, a magnetic field that falls off like one over the radius. And that results in, in what we call drifts across the field line. If you think about these gyro orbits, when the magnetic field is varying, the gyro orbit on one side, on the strong field side, is smaller than it is on the large field side. And so instead of making little circles, it doesn't actually bite its own tail, and it continues to drift in a particular direction. If you follow these drifts around, they make what are called um, banana orbits. So what we do, I mean, look, if you don't do anything else, they'll drift right out of the, of the device, and, and then you won't be able to find the plasma anywhere near long enough. So what we do in tokamaks is we generate a field in the other direction. You drive a current through the, the torus, and that generates a colloidal field, a field in this direction. And um, that averages out these drifts and leads to closed, well-confined banana orbits, which are illustrated here. So the particles, instead of just drifting their way right out of the device, they, 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 drift, they drift up on one side, down on the other side, and execute these. Um, these banana orbits and stay confined. As I mentioned, so they have to stay confined across thousands of kilometers and dozens of collisions in order to achieve fusion gain. So fundamentally, the, the one of the challenges we're facing in a fusion system is that again, in the core of the plasma, we have to reach temperatures something like 10 times hotter than the core of the sun. Because we're trying to produce a fusion energy density that's a lot higher than what is in the sun, right? Because we need to build a small system that's cost attractive. So we go to temperatures 100 to 200 million degrees, 10 times hotter than the core of the sun. But eventually, this device has to connect down to material surfaces. And material surfaces, of course, you know, that you, at, at most you can go to something like 1,000, 1,500 degrees C. You put that in units of KDV, it's 10 to the minus 4. When we do simple um, force balance analysis on the first open field line, and you set your conditions down here so that the materials can survive, you find that the temperature and pressure that you can achieve on this, this last closed flux surface is around um, 0.1 kV, in other words, about 1,000 degrees C, and a pressure of about a kilopascal. So in order to go from the separate tricks into the core conditions that you need, you have to increase the temperature about 100-fold and the pressure about 1,000-fold to reach fusion conditions. And we can do that just with, you know, in, in principle with our magnetic field and our size. But if you do it in that way, um, you know, you have turbulent transport in the core that, that limits the gradients that you can have. You have large scale magneto hydrodynamic dynamic instabilities that limit the overall pressure that you can reach. So you would need to go to, in order to reach fusion conditions, quite a large size, high current and high field. And that's potentially a very expensive device. But an ideal solution to this, if you could just wave a wand and do whatever you wanted to with the conditions, would be to suppress that turbulent transport and sh build sharp gradients across the outer part of the confined plasma. Why, why do you want to do it there? Why right at the outside? And that's basically because the instabilities are driven by gradients. 
but the fusion power is driven by the pressure. It goes like the pressure squared. And so by putting the gradients at the edge, you get the maximum amount of fusion per amount of drive for instabilities. And so you can get broad profiles for high global pressure limit, large fusion volume, high fusion performance. And just this, this ability to form a barrier and reach very high density and temperature very quickly across a few percent of the edge of the edge plasma was discovered spontaneously in experiments on, on the Aztecs Pokemac in Germany. This was a really exciting discovery. More than a factor of two improvement in, in, in fusion confinement was achieved spontaneously. And we've been working hard to understand the physics of what we call the edge pedestal. We call it a pedestal because it looked like, particularly before you had very high resolution measurements, looked like you were taking the temperature and density profiles and just lifting them up on a pedestal when you went into this H mode transition. So the pedestal is this very narrow region shown in red here on the right. It's a narrow layer of a very steep pressure gradient, but the rest of the plasma, the core plasma that's fusing sits on top of the pedestal. And we can have something like a 10 times increase in the temperature, 40 times increase in pressure across just this narrow layer, which is typically larger than the relative increase inside the core. So most of the confinement or roughly half, a little bit more of the confinement is occurring just in this narrow pedestal region. So if we can understand that, we can potentially um, get a really strong optimization of the fusion system. And this, again, to illustrate this, because of the way um, turbulence and turbulent transport in the core is driven by gradients, which roughly fix the gradient scale lengths in the core. What this means is that when we calculate the fusion power in a system like ITER, for example, we predict that the fusion power will go like the square of the pedestal pressure. So this is an enormous factor in determining, well, for example, the success of ITER, but also the, um, the overall performance of, of, of any fusion device that you would want to design operating in this H mode regime. So we've put, spent a lot of effort over the last couple of decades studying this region. It's extremely complex because of the narrow region of very high gradients. You get a massive variation in the rel relevant spatio um, temporal scales. Direct simulation is impossible. One has to use um, reductions of various sorts. But doing that and, and developing intuition over the years, we eventually built this model that we call the EPED model. And it's designed to cut through the complexity of the physics and the pedestal and generate a predictive model. And what it does is relatively straightforward. It schematically div um, divides instabilities that, that drive transport and affect stability in the pedestal into instabilities that are global nodes that extend across this whole pedestal region and can stop it from, um, from, from increasing in time versus nearly local modes within the edge barrier, which determine gradients. And we developed a conjecture um, that while other kinds of transport are important, including collisional transport, electron micro instabilities, that a couple of kinds of modes, one called the KBM magnetic ballooning mode, which limits gradients, and one called the peeling ballooning mode, which is global and extends across this whole region, are the primary limiters. And we can, with that conjecture, we can develop a fairly simple model using um, calculated tools like a code called, called Elite that a um, colleague Howard Wilson and I developed a while back. You can use model equilibria so that you don't have to, you know, have an experiment already been done. You can make predictions for the future, input the field and the geometry um, and, and other related parameters, and calculate the pedestal height as a function of width. Calculate one constraint from these global peeling ballooning modes. Calculate another constraint from these nearly local kinetic ballooning modes, and lo and behold, these two constraints behave differently and give you a prediction of sort of by the black circle of the height and the width which we can then compare to experiment. In this case, this is a prediction that we made before an experiment on D3D, and we found very good agreement between the prediction and experiment. We've done such experiments on numerous devices. This plot is showing a comparison with more than 800 cases on six different tokamaks of the predicted pedestal height against the measure. And this simple model works surprisingly well. I mean, there are cases where it doesn't work as well and they identify important physics, but they, the overall um, level of agreement gives us confidence that we understand uh, significantly the underlying physics and we can use this to predict the, 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 the performance of future machines. In particular, we can couple this physics model of the pedestal to models of the turbulent transport that I was talking about in the core. Um, putting those two models together, iterating them back and forth to yield a converged solution, we can actually predict 
the whole profiles, the electron temperature, ion temperature, electron density profile, which means we're predicting the fusion performance. This is something that was determined empirically for decades. And now we have tools that can actually predict it with no free parameters um, from, from basic principles, basic underlying physical principles. So this is a revolutionary capability that we're continuing to extend and explore. Um, a really cool thing that happens when you develop some understanding of the physics underlying these the, you know, things like the pedestal is that you could potentially use that understanding not just to understand stuff that you've already seen, right? Of course, we want to do that. There are observations. We want to understand them. But once you have a model, you can think about, does this model tell us anything that we didn't already know? Is there something more out there that we could potentially do? And crazy idea, you know, that, that came to us when we were thinking about this model. Well, this, you know, based on this observation, so I showed you this plot of pedestal height, pedestal width. We calculate our two constraints, and that gives us a prediction. An interesting thing that if you go to strongly shaped, strongly D-shaped plasmas in particular, that you find that if you if you increase the, the pedestal along this kinetic balloon criticality along this green line, you, you run into an instability, you go unstable. But if you, for, you know, just for curiosity's sake, continue to increase the pedestal height, you find you'll eventually go stable again. Um, at, at first, that seems just like a curiosity, right? Because when you hit this first instability, you get what's called an edge localized mode now, and that stops the pedestal from evolving. And so you just sit down here and evolve. But this isn't really a two dimensional physical phenomenon. It's a two dimensional plot, but there are 10 input parameters into the model. It's in some sense a 10 dimensional model. And you can change some of those other dimensions. Particularly, you can move in the third dimension of density. So this is a plot for one value of the plasma density. If you lower the plasma density in this plot, this unstable region in the middle will get smaller and smaller and smaller until it goes away entirely. Once it's gone away entirely, you can jump up to this top solution. And then you can raise the density again and, and bring this unstable region back, but now you're up here. And now the, the pedestal is twice as high as it was before, the fusion power four times as high. And so, um, you know, that's interesting theory, right? Our experimental colleagues, of course, were skeptical as usual, but we actually, you know, designed experiments to try to reach this. And it, it was hard, you know, controlling these plasmas and getting them to follow the parametric trajectory that you want them to follow is not always trivial, but, we did do it. I mean, this is so first illustrating that if you just, you know, go at constant, this is taking that, that super H plot and now plotting it with a third dimension of density, not showing the width anymore, but that's being calculated itself consistently. So you, you get this predicted that the black here is the usual H mode solution. The red are these super H mode solutions that we predict sit above that. If you just go at constant density, you're never going to reach these solutions. But if you can follow a trajectory that goes down in density and back up again, or starts at low and goes up in principle, you can reach this. And we did a lot of work experimentally, first on D3D, dynamically controlling and optimizing the density, um, and then later on Alcator CMOD, where we achieved record pedestal pressures to get into this region and achieve uh, the, the different physics in this region also has other advantages potentially in terms of getting the diverter cooler, and that's continuing to be explored on D3D by folks like Matthias Nolper and Teresa Wilkes. So I mentioned the experiment on CMOD. This was kind of dramatic. Um, I think some of you who, you know, those of you that worked in Fusion know the Alcator CMOD tokamak at MIT was shut down back in 2016. And in that you know, which of course was, was was a sad loss for the fusion program. But something really interesting happened in that last campaign is that they became very open to sort of out of the box ideas. And one of, one of those that they accepted was our proposed experiment on super H mode. And we got some time on Alcator CMOD just a couple of weeks before the end of their operation. And we, we found some really promising results. And then they gave us some additional time just before midnight on the day that they shut down. And on the very last good shot that was ever run on CMOG, we achieved um, this result here, which achieved the highest pedestal pressure which has ever been achieved on any device. That was seven years ago, it's still the highest now. Um, and you know, also was in reasonably good agreement with the model. Also all three of these top points that in this plot of comparing the model with the experiment that I showed you, are from the, that campaign, from those last two weeks of Alcator CMOD operation. And no points like that, you know, CMOD had run for, I don't know, 30 years. 
the points like that had never been seen before, before we made this dedicated effort to, um, to reach them. So theoretical predictions really do help, you know, optimize experiments. So super H, you know, we achieved the record pedestal pressure of 81 kilopascal. Um, the model has now been successfully tested over two orders of magnitude and pressure um, on six tokamaks. So, and this is just showing, you know, I mentioned the normalized for fusion performance. You normalize fusion performance to this factor, current times size times magnetic field. It gives you a useful indication of how well um, your, your, your regime is performing for a given um, inputs, basically, the key inputs into the process. And you can see that these super H mode um, discharges, at least for a short period of time, we have to work on sustainment achieve very high performance. Performance that if you translate it to ITER would correspond to ITER meeting its goals. And I should mention at the bottom here, the super H performance, the success of these experiments has also helped motivate an upgrade that's underway right now at D3D. I can't believe this, but they actually, and I've been telling them for years, they have an up, a pump on the upper inner side of their of the tokamak that takes up the most valuable real estate in the tokamak and prevents you from making the really optimized shapes. And they, they took it out, it's gone. And so we're in the next campaign gonna be able to run experiments that we haven't been able to before and explore this physics in greater depth. So that was a little interlude about pedestal physics and about some of the work that my colleagues and I have, have done individually and the transition back now to the overall um, Oak Ridge uh, fusion program and our vision again, is to bring it all together. We want this integrated simulation and design platform. So the pedestal physics I just described tied to the core physics and the, and the edge and the boundary physics. That's just one part of it. We also want to connect to the tritium fuel cycle, the blankets, um, the, the, the PMI and PFs, the basic components and the balance of plant. Translate our fundamental knowledge into workable designs, leverage enhanced um, computation for either operation, or the pilot plant or next generation facility design and enabling you know multiple activities signed simultaneously like module development and integration validation and improvement design and optimization of new systems and so this is you know the, the project the new project that i mentioned that that uh, Candy collins is starting the one that sebastian is is, is sebastian uh, de pasquale is, is leading are important aspects of this and we're continuing to build um so that's that's cutting edge science. Let me just quickly say a few things. Of course, you know, science is one thing. We need to have facilities to test our models on, to qualify materials, and we're very interested in delivering those those kinds of facilities. The first one of those I want to mention is the Eater Project. I think many of you are familiar with it. The the U.S. Um, Eater Project office uh, sits right quite close by here, over in Commerce Park, um, and Oak Ridge hosts this project office which involves uh, more than a billion dollars in U.S. contracts. You know, ITER is being built in France, but most of the money that the U.S. spends is spent here in the U.S. building components and di diagnostics and other capabilities for ITER, which are then shipped over to the site in France. And it's designed to produce 500 megawatts of fusion power for 400 seconds. So it allows us to test our understanding at a reactor scale, including um, long time evolution. And it's set for fusion power demonstration in the 30s. So what do we actually do with our hands and feet? I mean, the, the project office working together with the contractors, including General Atomics out of San Diego, is delivering first of a kind and essential fusion hardware to the international project. The importance of this has been widely recognized. And we are working together with um, Princeton Plasma Physics Lab and Savannah River National Lab to deliver US in kind components, including this, the central solenoid, the steady state electrical network, tokamak water cooling, exhaust, um, radio frequency, electrocyclotron components, pellet fueling, and diagnostics. So the fourth um, module of the central solenoid, what they call the heartbeat of eater that sits in the middle of it, has been completed and being prepared for shipment. The other thing that we're doing, you know, right now on the Oak Ridge campus itself, um, in building 7625 right next to where our fusion offices are, is building the impacts device. And this, this is the materials plasma exposure experiment, as its name implies, designed to test materials under fusion conditions. And it's capable of lifetime exposure of materials in two weeks of operation. So it runs continuously. You expose materials to these very high fluxes, expose them to such high fluxes that you get a sense of what a very long-term exposure in a reactor would do. And you can do, we can do this with separate heating systems to control different parameters at the target with interchangeable targets, capability of going all the way to 10 megawatts per meter squared um, and exposing irradiated materials, for example, that come from hyper 
um, and liquid metals. And it's, it's designed to start operation at, at current budget levels in, in FY28. So we have a vision, you know, at, at Oak Ridge for timely completion of US and kind components to ITER, delivering the impacts project. Of course, we want to do that on time and on budget and on spec. And we want to do it as part of a vibrant fusion materials program in the US, as well as establish the mission need and identify the best approach for a fusion prototypic neutron source so that we can test materials under an actual fusion energy neutron to build a critical material science gap. And there's work being done on that. And we want to work with the community to establish best paths for a world-leading public um, next generation facility as well. So finally, the private program. I think you've heard a lot in the news about some of these private fusion companies. They've generated more than, than $6 billion in funding. Um, we are working with them in a number of different ways to leverage our expertise um, to deliver and inform their you know, breakthrough technologies, fusion pilot plant designs. We want to leverage facility capabilities to provide component testing and qualification integration tests. And then finally, leverage siting op op options. This area, the Oak Ridge area, I mean, what area could be better, you know, for potentially siting these kinds of facilities? So we're working with them on both, you know, potentially siting next generation risk reduction demonstration facilities, and then in the longer run, potential fusion pilot plants. So we, we, we're seeking to enable private industry at all stages of development. The innovation stage, um, providing technical support on developing innovative ideas, and this is seeded by in part by the INFUSE program that, that, that Oak Ridge um, helps run for the Department of Energy and providing expert advice on assistance and developing technology um, and design. And this is part of the Milestone program, this new program that just kicked off this year, sort of like a SpaceX for fusion um, program. And then finally, building, providing on-site or nearby siting opportunities to help us get to a pilot plant. So as I mentioned, it, um, Oak, Oak Ridge, um, together with our partner, Princeton Plaza Physics Lab, um, leads this infused innovative network of perfusion energy program that that ties together 11 participating DOE labs with um, a bunch of fusion private companies to provide technical support to a very wide range of development activities and a number of them are given here including you know diagnostics development actuator um, measurements liquid metal corrosion facilities one of these for example that um the Ted viewer has been very involved in is, is development of a portable diagnostic package that enables us to make measurements flexible. And then with, with a traveling diagnostic set that, that, that Ted and his crew literally put in a van and can drive up to you know, Princeton or other locations to do measurements on facilities and, and confirm that these, you know, these private fusion devices are doing what we think they're doing. So the milestone program, finally, this, this, this program was just spun up um, this past year by DOE, um, Office of Fusion Energy Sciences. It's a $48 million program for private companies. It's basically a 50% cost share. They set out a set of milestones. If they reach those milestones, then the government reimburses them for half of their expenses in doing so. Eight awards were announced. Of those eight companies that were awarded, um, ORNL was involved in the proposals of six of them, the six that are listed here. Um, Commonwealth, Realta, FIA, Topamac Energy, Type 1 Energy, and Eximer. Most of these are, are magnetic energy or magnetic fusion focused, but Eximer is focused on inertial fusion energy with lasers. Our technical scope in these projects um, covers a wide range, including plasma modeling and simulation, engineering device modeling and simulation using some of the tools I mentioned. A lot of focus, that's why it's in bold, on developing breeding blanket simulation and design capabilities. Oak Ridge has a lot of capability there and not many places do. Pellet and fuel cycle development, materials analysis and testing, remote handling, as well as molten salt flow design and experimental. So, you know, as I mentioned, here's, you know, an aerial view of ORNL. I think you're all familiar with the area, with the region. There, the, there are multiple siting options in the region, you know, on campus, off campus, many other areas that have the required water, electricity needs. There's a demonstrated capability to host major projects involving national teams, um, like SNS, for example. There's a broad range of technical capabilities, which is important to pilot plant success. And there are strong regional partners, including universities and utilities, um, comprehensive portfolio from understanding development. There's strong support from the state. I'm sure many of you have heard of the, the nuclear initiative that the state of Tennessee is, is, is rolling out. So all in all, it's, it's potentially a great place to do fusion. I think some of you who live in Oak Ridge may have seen that one of these companies, um, Type 1, has already opened up an office here in Oak Ridge. 
and we hope to see more of these of this kind of in the future. So to summarize, um, Oak Ridge is committed to enabling an aggressive U.S. fusion energy program, working very closely um, in partnership, of course, with the Department of Energy and with private companies. It, it's an ex really exciting time for the development of fusion. There's been major advances in both the science and the technology, and of course, the overall focus on and investment in clean energy has driven a renaissance um, in fusion, as well as in other areas of, of energy research. Um, ORNL is well positioned to have a significant impact on the technical readiness of fusion through advances in state of the art of critical science and, and technology areas, development of integrated design toolkits. As I said, we want to be the, the, the institution that brings it all together the science, the technology to enable the actual optimization, accelerating the design of, of this optimization process for fusion systems. We're, su we're supporting the private industry technology roadmaps through the milestone program, through Infuse, and of course we have strong and developing partnerships both internationally and within the, the US. This is of course not something that ORNL is doing alone, but, but, but working closely with, with a number of partners. So we're preparing the way for early demonstration of fusion electricity through preparing the technical basis for key technologies, particularly the blanket technology required to efficiently harness fusion power and produce tritium, and developing the structural and functional materials and plasma facing components that are going to be needed. Um, we're also developing a siting policy to enable streamlined deployment of fusion facilities either on or near the Oak Ridge campus. So thanks for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. Light screen so we can see each other. <laughs> yes. Um, I came from the fusion management division. I hadn't done any since oh, 15 years, I guess. Uh huh. But I dealt with the first world problem. Yes. And a problem which was not addressed at the time because it was not interesting, was what do you do with all the hydrogen that's in the wall material and all the material that's inside the device? Because you've got heat and the experiments which I did, I found that the if you took deuterium, and you put it up as a plasma mm -hmm. uh, in a graphite yep. container. Mm -hmm. You could start off with 100% deuterium, and after about a few milliseconds, it was 50% hydrogen. Oh, okay. So you're it talking about hydrogen, pro from, protium specifically, as opposed to, okay. That is correct. Yeah. And that gotcha. problem, as near as I can tell, has not been addressed for 25 years. Yeah. Well, as I mentioned, I mean, one of the really important things that's going on in the fusion program, kind of right now, kind of as we speak, is this transformation to bring the focus out to technology and materials issues and these material issues associated with you know absorption of deuterium and tritium hydrogen is a related issue you know formation of helium bubbles inside materials these are all some of the critical you know aspects that, that have to be addressed and yeah i mean I, I agree with you more research is needed in this area um there's you know there's there's a good bit of nice work i, I don't show too much of it here um that's going on in you know the ornl um, material science and technology division, but we're just starting to get to the point where, um, you know, where more so more significant amounts of funding are becoming available for these direct tests of plasma material interactions. Of course, ITER will be a platform for that to some extent. We at Oak Ridge, we collaborate with the, the West Tokamak, which has um, tungsten walls, so we can, you know, explore there the interaction of deuterium with tungsten. Of course, we have a program on, you know, strong program on D3D, which has carbon walls. So, you know, doing comparisons of different technologies, as well as working on smaller scale facilities, eventually impacts. Right now, we just have a, we have a small device on campus called ProtoLite, 
which uh, Jurgen Rath is just getting back up and running again. And, you know, we collaborate with a number of other facilities that do materials testing. So yeah, it's, it's an important area. I, I agree. It's something that needs, that needs more study, needs serious consideration. And it becomes a different kind of problem when you start thinking about time scales of days and weeks and months rather than time scales of seconds and minutes like we that have is, past. Yes. Yeah. It is a real problem which hasn't really been addressed. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked uh, here at, uh, from 54 to 63 on ECX 1 and 2, a big experiments at uh, 112. Mm -hmm. And I went to Livermore and worked from 63 to 70 on Astra and a lot of the other things there. Okay. And uh, meanwhile, uh, from the New Mexico demonstration in 1945, the Soviet Sarabamba demonstration of an H bomb 57 megatons in 1961. That's a 15 year interval. Uh -huh. And it demonstrated, of course, that you can scale an H bomb to any size at all if you have a very small uh, fission device for trigger. And so it raises my question is uh, we hear over and over about tokamak and all the uh, permutations and maybe uh, accelerator. But then we have the uh, progress coming from Livermore now with uh, NIF. And uh, why not hybrid things? I mean, the reason H bombs work is because you have a nice little fission trigger and you get enough uh, to compress the plasma and hold it long enough to do what it does. And so why can't you do the same thing with uh, the progress in, in what we're doing now? There has been some thought and consideration to hybrid systems. I mean, you know, I, as I mentioned, you know, some of the, the companies that we're working with, well, Hexamer in particular, you know, there, there is, particularly within the milestone program, exploration of a variety of different concepts. Um, you know, Hexamer's laser fusion, um, real there is actually using an updated version of a mirror machine. Fission fusion hybrids have been studied a lot in the past. I'm not really an expert on those systems. I think a lot of the studies that, that I was familiar with, like when I was at General Atomics, tended to come to the conclusion that if you optimize the fission fusion hybrid system, you'd either end up with an optimum that was all fusion or all fission. But, you know, as as we develop these tools further, we can think about those things. But it is, you know, there are there are challenges. Yeah. Um, the, with, the point is that it, it enables the fastest uh, physics influence on the future of the human race in only fifteen years interval. Yeah, and, and we need uh, here seventy years into controlled fusion. We yeah, to really get serious. It's, it's a shame to wait another twenty years. Uh, yeah, well, pe people like to talk about years, right, and time, right? But, you know, we just, time just passes and we twiddle our thumbs. Nothing's going to happen. You know, we're not magically going to get fusion on the grid. It's a question of resources and effort. I mean, just like, I mean, if, if, if Oak Ridge is obviously beyond anywhere, right? Look at the Manhattan Project. Look at what happens when somebody decides something's urgent and they pour a lot of resources in it, you can do it. There, there was an interesting study in fusion, you know, back in the 1980s where they laid out pathways to fusion and what would be the resources required to develop fusion on certain time scales. And basically anything under a couple billion dollars a year was fusion never. So we, we've been on a fusion never trajectory for the last 30 years. And it, it's, it's not a surprise. I mean, in some ways it was intentional, right? I mean, we changed the name of the Office of Fusion Energy to the Office of Fusion Energy Science when this program was scaled back. And the idea was we were going to advance the science. And there's some nice plots that I, that I didn't show you um, you know, that show this, right? You know, when we had this strong investment in the, you know, late 70s and 80s during the energy crunch, fusion just took off. It, it, you know, the advancement was much faster than the semiconductor industry that everybody talks about with Moore's Law. But then we hit kind of a resource cliff, right? The, the, the investment fell off, the energy crisis kind of in, you know, fizzled out and that, that, that took away the urgency, it took away the resources, just at a time when fusion was getting to the point where we needed bigger facilities and more resources in order to take off. So I think that's the critical thing. I think, you know, but in the meantime, while we were not making progress on you know, 
the, 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 the diffusion metrics, we were making a lot of progress on scientific understanding, which allows a lot of the optimization and a, and a lot of new technologies have been developed too, like you know, how the manufacturing ways of, of developing materials. So I think it is coming together. You know, you've seen that there's, there's now private investment into the system as well as the public investment. You know, there is more urgency to the climate crisis. So, you know, we are in the, and there is, you know, this is, you know, we of course want to keep the U.S. at the forefront, but the U.S. is not the only company investing here. There's significant investments going on in the U.K. and China, for example. Um, so I've got a very few graph for you that shows that plot. The 1977 report that shows has three different uh, logics or how we how we pursue. Yeah. And our, and our budget was followed the upper logic for about another six months and went down. And and we're we're now at about at least when I left the program we were about. 15% of the funding that was fusion never. Yeah. But um, you know, but the rest of the world has has pitched in a lot more. So we, a lot more progress has been made in fusion than just here. You know, I would say uh, you know, you know, particularly jet and uh, you know the investment that the Europeans have made and, and the Asians have made have, have really made up. That's where we are, where we are, even though we've only spent 10% of what, what we said was minimum. Uh, but yeah, I, I have to say, this, uh, this is a much more coherent program, a uh, mm -hmm. uh, picture of, of what it takes to get to some real fusion than we ever had when I was in the world. And, and uh, uh, it looks like that, uh, that ORNL really is well positioned for that. And uh, so it may get it, it uh, harkening back. You know, when I was there, it seemed like the, 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 the Office of Fusion Energy's role was the care and feeding of Princeton Plasma Physics Lab and General Atomics and the rest of us, you know, were just sort of there, you know, compromised guys. Um, but it seems to be different. Uh, so, so, I, I mean, so what's changed? I mean, Seemed like it was benign, like both from from office fusion and energy and from lab management, but this looks different. And um, so, what's our what's the overall no budget, and what's the principal as the physics budget? <laughs> Those are complicated questions. I mean, <laughs> I may only have you, five more minutes. You wrote a lot into that. Into that was uh, uh, impressive. Um, <laughs> The budgets, I mean, let me start with this. The, 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 you know, there was this rollout of the bold decadal vision, you know, at the White House about a year ago. And the president's, the administration budget for fusion this year was over a billion dollars, was the highest fusion budget ever, I believe, even in real dollars. And so that, and, and included the rollout of technologies of centers and materials and blankets and simulation and enabling technology, all the, the key areas that, that we would identify as important. So there is a risk, what, what's changed? I mean, well, there's the private company interest, but there's there's significant more 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 interest in the administration. I mean, the administration launched this this um, milestone program. The administration proposed a large budget. Of course, it's getting trapped in what's going on in Congress right now. We're not actually going to get. That record budget most likely will get will get some kind of increase, but a small one. Um, but the you know the combination that I think that the progress is important, the NIF results, the JET results, those things are important. The confidence that's being expressed by the private companies, confidence that's being expressed by the national academies, right? I mean, the government commissioned those reports, and the response that it got back was that now is the time to to do this, to get serious about this. Yeah. Just a minute, uh, David Fields. Do we have any questions from the from the Zoom? Well, we're open to them. Uh, we can ask anyone that wants to uh, submit a question to unmute themselves and have a go at it. Herb. There is one comment that I can comment on online. It's, it says. Please talk a little about a neutronic reactions such as proton boron 11. Might the new experimental tool of generating attosecond light pulses 
uh, be utilized to shed light on the brown strolling problem. It's, it's, it's an interesting comment. It's a great comment. I mean, deuterium tritium, the DT reaction is by far the easiest reaction to drive. It has a much higher cross section than sort of the next tier of reactions, which would be deuterium deuterium or deuterium helium three. And then you go down a, another significant step and you get reactions like people on 11, but people on 11 has a nice property of being largely a neutronic. Of course, when you reach these conditions, you're gonna get some side reactions that generate some, some neutrons. I mean, the way I look at it is those things are kind of second generation fusion, right? If we had a system that could that could do those things, it could do DT very easily. And so we were going to pro progress on our way to get there. But there are there are ideas out there for how to approach these things. And like you say um, in, in this question, one of the problems with, with trying to do something like even DDD helium-3 or people or people on 11 fusion is that when you, you have to go to much higher pressures and temperatures. And when you do that, you get more um, loss, radiative losses from Bremsstrahlung. If it's a magnetic system from cyclotron radiation, then you have to come up with ways to, you know, reflect or absorb those losses so they don't just fall out of the system. Otherwise it can become, for people on 11 in particular, um, impossible, at least assuming a thermal distribution to reach fusion conditions. So I think, you know, there's a primary focus on DT because it's easiest, but it does have some disadvantages. Obviously, we'd rather not deal with tritium if we didn't have to. Um, but those other reactions are harder as we continue to advance the science and technology. I suspect we'll find ways. And yeah, these improvements in laser technology are one one potential route um, that are others as well. We have one question that came in from Robert you. requesting a, a little bit of talk about a neutronic reaction, such as uh, yeah. yeah, that's the one I just he just did yeah yeah. He just yeah. did. I should have read. I should have read the name. Yeah, from here. Here I am. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Thank you very much. Good answer. You touched on cooling of the blankets mm -hmm. using helium. Yes. Can you hear, can you hear now? Yes. Go on. Okay. Well, um, so yeah, it's a great question. You know, this, this issue, can you use water cooling in these systems? The Europeans are still building water cooling into their demo oh, design, I interestingly. I so it hasn't been completely abandoned, but I would say that in the U.S., we are largely looking in other directions. Yes. And helium cooling is one of those. Particularly in the concept that one of the concepts that's been explored quite a bit is what's called a dual cooled lead lithium blanket. So there you form this lead lithium eutectate, which helps to lower the chemical activation of the lithium, deal with your corrosion issues a little bit. And but you can't flow well. It's difficult to flow the lead lithium quickly enough for it to be the only coolant. Of course, the flow of that liquid provides some of your cooling, but then in addition to that, you use helium cooling, particularly on the surfaces closer to the plasma, which are getting the largest heat flux, and you de develop this combined system between helium cooling and the cooling provided by the lead lithium itself um, that can, you know, together How? get to where you need without dealing with these issues that you mentioned if you have. You know, How it advanced is that design coming along? Is I mean, that was the Achilles heel as I saw it with the Eater project. From a simulation point of view, there's there's been a good bit of work, and you know, including here here at Oak Ridge. And as I mentioned, you know, in the blanket slide, let's see if I can go back to it here. Um, we do 
you know, intend to try to build experimental facilities beyond what we have to test out some of those capabilities. I've got too many slides to go through, let's say, like here, um, you know, in terms of, you know, helium cooling, which would be probably likely part of a dual cooling system, you know, testing this lead lithium compatibility with veritic steel, um, thermal in the thermal convection loop. So actually, you know, building a driven loop to test this 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 uh, more more thoroughly. You know, eventually you want to get a true breeding system with neutrons, right? But that's expensive. We need you know we need the resources to build that kind of cell. And the other side, uh, we're, we're going to have to cut mm -hmm. this thing off. And with you 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 can continue after. Uh, at this point, we'll we'll have to terminate. Uh, but thank you, uh, Phil, for a very uh, very inclusive talk here. Yeah, thank thank you very thank you very much. Anybody? Any other questions? You can bring them up. Phil is All right. Design review time. Yeah, we are